I'm Liz Johnson, Beijing 2008 Paralympic champion, and I'm in the stream. Hi, I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, activists from all over the world are heading to Washington, D.C. to find solutions for the lack of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And they're here in the stream to tell us how they're solving the problem. percent of the world's disabled population are of working age, but the right to work is frequently denied to them. According to the International Labour Organization, the employment rate for people with disabilities is roughly 25 percent lower than those without a disability. Many face what Nobel Peace Prize laureate Amartya Sen calls the conversion handicap. It's the idea that people with disabilities require more resources to achieve the same outcomes as non-disabled people, thus making them more costly employees and less desirable workers. And once they're able to find work, they generally earn less than those without a disability, which means many people with disabilities are under the threat of poverty. So how can governments and corporations make workplaces more inclusive? Here to discuss that in our studio, we have David Egan. He's an intellectual disabilities advocate and a J.P. Kennedy Jr. public policy fellow, the first person with an intellectual disability to hold that position. Tom Harkin is the former U.S. Senator and lead architect of the Americans with Disabilities Act legislation that gave comprehensive civil rights to people with disabilities. He's also the founder of the Harkin International Disability Employment Summit happening this week. Lizzie Kiyama is an inclusive business and strategic partnerships expert in Kenya, and she's playing an instrumental role in establishing the Kenya Business and Disability Network. And via Skype, right here in Washington, D.C., Rajasay Karana Pa Aniaban. He is the co-founder of Vishesh, and that's a company whose goal is to make sure people with disabilities find the right type of work. Hello, everybody. Welcome. David. When you were born, back in the 19th, blah, 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 um, what were the expect expectations of what jobs that you might be able to do? Well, first, Is it okay if I say 1977? Um, yes. All right. Yes, that's correct. All right, okay. Um, could you ask the question again? Yeah, when you, when you were born, what, back in the 70s, what were the expectations of people with intellectual disabilities uh, in terms of what could they do in the workplace? What was possible? I think there's many possibilities of employment. I mean, you can look at, at a spectrum mm. of many employment settings. Um, the biggest issue in employment um, is to be respected on the job, and at the same time, for individuals with disabilities to be competitively employed. Ah. And you get many different views and perspectives about that. Best job you've ever had? Hmm. Um, you should I, probably I, say the current one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well... <laughs> In case the boss is watching. Uh, yeah, that's a very excellent question. <laughs> I put you on the spot here. I'm trying to uh, answer it the best way I can. And I can yeah. tell you, I don't know if they're watching or not, uh -huh. but um, in the past 20 years, I've worked for Booz Allen Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, I started as a high school intern and into a paid staff um, position. Um, and now I also work for a company called CBRE. Uh -huh. It's a global commercial real estate company located in Los Angeles, California. Mm. Senator Harkin, this idea of there being challenges still with people with disabilities getting into the workplace, what would you say was the biggest challenge right now? Well, I think the biggest challenge is for companies to understand uh, private sector companies to understand that people with disabilities can sometimes be their best employees and be profitable, be a profit-making part of their business. Uh, sometimes it's an attitudinal barrier that they, people just don't think someone with a disability could do this job. Uh, it's, 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 and it's making workplaces universally accessible for everyone. 
So I love that you end that, making workplaces accessible, because for so many people that tweeted us and want to be part of this conversation today, many of them are saying, we can't even have this conversation until we start talking about getting to the workplace itself. So this is Michelle in NYC, that's her handle. She says, I think it's important to note that it isn't just about making a workplace accessible, though of course it is, she says. She goes on to say, it's also a matter of being able to actually get there. In my case, though I'm unable to work, I need a proper wheelchair. I'm lucky that I live in the New York City area where this, where there is public transportation, but what do you do if you live in a more isolated area? Raja, I want to go to you with this question. I'm sure you must face people uh, who have this trouble, who don't live in areas where public transportation that is accessible is readily available. What happens then? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, one of the biggest challenges we face uh, is the cost of public transport not being accessible. You know, you don't have low floor bus buses. And, you know, not having public transportation which is accessible is the difference between having a job and not having a job. Um, in lots of cases, the, you know, having getting to use a transportation on a private basis costs as much as the paycheck of a month. You know, $100 a month is the cost of public access, not having public transportation. And that is what Amartya Sen uh, uh, mentioned about the conversion handicap, and that's the penalty that people are having to pay. So we are trying to work with organizations which are progressive, which are trying to, we are trying to advocate to them, hey, you're providing um, uh, pick up and drop facility for your employees. You please talk to your vendors, talk to your um, uh, to your car vendors and make, make sure your car is accessible. You, you provide pick up and drop services for people who use wheelchairs also. And, um, you know, we then do the sensitization sessions and, uh, you know, we align the cab driver so that he, there is appropriate etiquettes and uh, interaction that happens both um, uh, at the uh, the type of pickup and drop. So um, these are things which have worked and uh, there's a lot to be done. Of course, this uh, transportation is only one bit of uh, the, um, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the barriers that persons with disabilities face. And, the, and Senator uh, mentioned about attitudes. Um, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, issues, um, uh, you know, there's a huge um, baggage of uh, having, you know, bias that we all carry and all of us have carried carry that you know uh, David we have David here um, you know when we worked to, with a company saying can you hire persons with intellectual disability you know the first question they asked me this is a hotel industry uh -huh. they asked me oh what happens will 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 he be able, the person be able to uh, you know adjust to the workplace what happens if he uh, picks up a you know a detergent and eats it you know so we had to Sell, tell them why should the person actually uh, have a detergent? He, the person travels all the way, uses public transportation, crosses okay. the traffic, and gets to workplace. So, so I guess so these are, are smiling a little bit. I'm, I'm appalled. I'm appalled that someone would actually ask that. I, I, you're smiling as though you can recognize Lizzie. Well, for for me, I think people without non-disabled people, uh, particularly um, employers, tend to detach themselves from disability. Like this is something that happens to a specific group of people. And you know, when, when we, we're talking about inclusion, um, when a mother has a child with a disability, no one teaches her how to deal with this child. You figure it out. But somehow in the workplace, we, we treat people with disabilities like they're an, alien species, you know, like it's something so totally absurd that would not happen, you know, t to them. And I find in, in, in my work, I find as much as I work around um, employment, I'm having to work backwards, you know, I'm having to figure out accessible transport, I'm having to um, dabble in uh, sexual and reproductive health because my focus is women and girls with disabilities. So um, we're just having a conversation the other day and you know, I kept referring to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and with people with disabilities, we're still trying to figure out basic needs. You know? So the absurd comments and this, this is the reality, unfortunately, mm -hmm. sad as it is. Lizzie, I was watching you on YouTube and you're, you're in the YouTube frame and you're, you're advocating for people with disabilities and at the end you said, and I'm disabled because you actually had to point it out. Yes. I'm going to point it out for you. Will you tell us about uh, what are your challenges in the workplace so people watching uh, understand that? Because even getting into the studio yes. was not the easiest thing. Yes, yes. Um, as I said, I think um, the needs of people with disabilities are not taken seriously enough. Yeah. Um, 
I sometimes wonder if it was Hillary Clinton, for example, who was in a wheelchair. Would Al Jazeera, for example, have figured out my access needs? Or would she be subject to the same um, going through the basement, you know, trying to figure out the supply route, you know, <laughs> things like that. Yeah. I think that we are not respected, um, and I, I don't know why that is. How do you change that? How do you, how do you get the respect? For me, I think, I think it's looking at the value addition that people with disabilities bring. I don't know what um, the, the rest of the group thinks. Can, you know, coming here, um, you know, uh, uh, we found that employment as a very, very strong uh, litmus test for inclusion. You know, when persons get employed, when we got them jobs, suddenly, you know, the immediate family and friends start believing in the, the individual, the dignity that it brings, and not only makes the individual confident, but the entire um, um, the human race around them who work, interact with them, they feel, oh, this person can actually get a job and get a, get a salary. And uh, that really changes, and you need more. And so we find employment as a litmus test and find it it's, it's brings a lot of conviction and changes societal attitudes of how they look at an individual. And then, you know, probably that sets the trend for for accessible pathways, accessible restrooms, and maybe a better, um, you know, approach for Lizzie to come into the studio. <laughs> so, Raja, so, okay, you said employment is often a litmus test. If that's true, there's a tweet here from Kathleen. The senator, I'll give this to you. So Kathleen on Twitter says, employers may think reasonably accommodating employees with disabilities, as required by the ADA and state law, is more expensive than it actually is. What do you tell employers who think there, uh, there's no benefit to hiring someone with a disability because it will cost more. Well, it really doesn't cost more, and we have experts that can come in and help businesses uh, uh, figure that out. Let me tell you a short story. My brother was deaf from an early age, couldn't hear. He went to a school just for deaf kids. He was told he couldn't do anything other than be a baker. He didn't like it. One day a man came into the bake shop, asked him how he liked his job. He said, I hate it. <laughs> So what do you want to do? He said, I like to work on machines. Well, this man owned a business that made jet engine nozzles, very precise kind of work. So he hired my brother, come work for him. After about a month or two, he went to see his foreman and uh, said, how's Harkin doing? How's Frank Harkin, how's he doing? His foreman said, my God, this guy's fantastic. He never makes a mistake. He puts out more parts per hour than anybody else. It's amazing. Well, the owner of the company, Mr. Delavan said, well, we got to figure this out. They finally went down to the line where he worked and figured it out. This was a very noisy place. Things clanging and banging and bells ringing and people shouting and machines running. My brother was deaf. Didn't bother him a bit. He just went right ahead and worked on his little parts, never made a mistake. You know what Mr. Delavan did then, the owner? He went out and hired more deaf people. <laughs> See, you got to look beyond the disability to see what people are qualified for. I say to any business, look beyond the disability, see what a person is qualified for. If they do have a disability, they will be your best employees, uh, your most loyal employees. Once you have them trained, they'll be with you. David, there, there's a famous piece of video where you are giving testimony on Capitol Hill and you're talking about the importance of a mentor, a role model. Why is that important before we play the clip? Um, it's very important because um, this particular mentor I have known um, when I started working for the company of Booz on Hamilton and everybody is get, trying to get used to me. And so having friends at work is very important and having a mentor uh, to, to show me um, um, the, how the day-to-day -day tasks on the job will work for me. And it was very new to them. And so it was very interesting. And how are people's reactions to you? Um, at first, it was hard to accept um, ah. that for them to say, "Can this person, D David Egan, uh -huh. work for them?" Uh -huh. And I mean, I started out of high school as an intern, and um, it was very new. And at the same time, um, I was very involved in other activities. Uh -huh. um, so when I was with Booz Allen, it took me a little longer to, to know everything about working in a mail room. Right. Um, and just reflecting back on that, my friend, um, his, his name is Greg Jones. Ah, so I'm gonna ask you to pause for a moment 
because you said his name, which is our cue for playing the clip. So this is March 2011, and this is David Egan giving testimony on Capitol Hill. Have a look. His name is Greg. Uh, he has been quite a bit of a role model for me, and I know there are many others like him, but what strikes me the most is that he doesn't mind joking around with me a little, mm -hmm. so I don't mind that. It really shows that when you have an individual working in a corporate company, you want to make sure that there's someone there that can offer guidance and support. And, and someone joking around with you shows that, that he respects your sense of humor, that he says that you get what I'm saying. Um, absolutely. Um, he's not here, but I can tell you he's probably hearing this, hearing what, what right about now. And, and would you say he's funny? <laughs> when he's joking around with you, is he funny? Is this for the record? Yeah. <laughs> So when are you starting your stand-up career, Mr. Egan? Very nice. There was something that you didn't see, uh, audience, as you were watching that. Uh, our editor originally was going to take off the all caps uh, so that you can read it if you can't hear it very well. And we asked them to put it back on. Uh, and Senator, you were reading that clip as opposed to watching that clip. So sometimes it's very small things that make a difference. Mm -hmm. If you were talking about how businesses can be more inclusive, what would be the one piece of advice? If, if a business or a, a CEO is watching this and thinking, I need to be more open-minded, what would be the one thing you would tell them to help them do that? Set a goal. Okay. However many employees you have, set a goal that a certain percentage of your employees are going to be people with disabilities. Set up your HR team, your human resources team, uh, to make sure they go out and do outreach. So many people with disabilities who are very qualified to do different jobs never go there because they think they're going to be turned away. Uh, and so a lot of times they, they just don't apply for those jobs. So we need employers to go out and, and actually do outreach to bring people in, to let them know that there's jobs there, there's training and support. And I want to, I want to get back, if I can, to the cost item. Yes, yeah. There's another cost that businesses have. It's called turnover. Huh. Turnover is a big cost to businesses. You will find Businesses that employ people with disabilities have less turnover. That's a savings to them. You know, there are some uh, success stories that we're hearing from people. As, as, as many challenges are there, as there are, there are also people sharing uh, bright spots as they see it. Uh, this is one group called Easter Seals. They're an empowerment group for uh, women with disabilities. They tweeted in, uh, Easter Seals is great at hiring folks with disabilities. Starbucks and Apple, those corporations regularly hire us as well. That's how they put it, both remotely and in stores. I also want to share two perspectives out of India. We got two video comments um, from women who've said they've had positive experiences at their workplaces, one who did it herself and the other who's actually working with our guest Raja. Have a listen to these two. I entered my family business as a young girl on a wheelchair. That's when I realized that it's very important for me to prove myself independent as I wanted people to look up to me. I am Manjula. I'm working with ANZ since three and a half years now. Vishesh trained me with effective communication. ANZ is helping people like me in a very good manner. Having infrastructure that was accessible around me helped me immensely. I never felt like a specially able person over there because the ANZ gives equal opportunity to everyone. Uh, I feel comfortable moving in the premises because it is uh, friendly for specially able person. How an enabling infrastructure, having it accessible, not just affects only the disabled, but also the elderly, also people suffering with temporary disabilities. So, Raja, what can other companies uh, outside of India learn from these two experiences? And, and, and what is it that India should learn or can learn from others in our global community? Sure. 
Um, the big, um, you know, what we see here um, is both cases creating self-employment and the other case of unemployment. And in both cases, um, we see uh, the enabling infrastructure, the conducive infrastructure, as Minu mentioned about accessible, um, um, you know, pathways, etc. And uh, um, uh, we had Manjula talking about how ANZ did not treat her as a separate, uh, uh, different individual. They gave her equal opportunity to to perform and succeed. You know, so important thing, the key message of, we see is when a person with disability gets a job. It is not the induction or onboarding of that individual alone. It is the entire workforce that needs to be inducted. So sensitization is the key. You know, the um, it's important for organizations to hire and include persons with disabilities at workplace by sensitizing, changing the attitudinal barriers. There are so much, so many unconscious bias that recruiters and HR managers have, and we got to recognize that we have, they have biases, and then overcome that in their interviewing process and make sure you make a selection based on ability. Ability is what counts, and, and not you know, not just abilities that, that counts, but you need to also make sure the accommodations are provided. Um, accommodations are not necessarily expensive. There are high tech, low tech, and no tech expenses also. You just need to apply yourself um, innovatively, and you will see a lot of accommodations which are what? actually have low cost and it benefits a lot. Yeah, lot did more. you know what I'm hearing? I'm just hearing to businesses make an effort, just like make an effort and invest and it's worthwhile. Let me show you something here, Lizzie, and our audience. This is from The Guardian. It says Russia and the US have the worst employment gaps for disabled people. Where is Kenya? How would you say Kenya is doing? Kenya is doing really badly. Um, we have excellent laws, but the enforcement of which is lacking. Ah. Yeah. So. You rolled your eyes. When you're like, so how's Kenya <laughs> doing? You're like, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is. What do you do about that? So for me, I, I, I'm trying to bridge the gap, trying to help the government actually um, create a framework to engage with, with the corporates on how to promote disability inclusion, how to influence yeah. um, more commitment from, from businesses. We have laws that require both public and private organizations to reserve at least 5% employment opportunities, but this is not happening. Right. Yeah. Mm. See, this is really interesting because, um, Senator, you were very famously involved in the American Americans with Disabilities Act, very famously so. Um, you're an icon, basically. You did your speech from the floor of the Senate in sign language. If I showed it to you, could you translate it for the rest of us who don't speak sign language? Turn around there. Let me press play. How much of it are you showing? We're not going to show all of it. <laughs> you're a senator. You can talk some. But let's have a look. Here we go. That's a long time ago. Yes. Mr. President. Say it out loud, Senator. I'm going to have to go and learn American Sign Language. I have a hard time seeing it. I'm sorry. Oh, right. I'm having okay. a hard time. See, see, this is interesting. That was a good example of, at some point, all of us could be in a position where maybe our hearing is not as good as it, as it has been. Our sight may not be as good as it has been. Lizzie, you had a car accident. Yes, so it doesn't yeah. take much for us to go from... No, it doesn't. We, we cannot afford to detach ourselves yeah. from disability. Because it could be us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Maybe I could um, say something about that. Everybody has a disability in some way. Mm -hmm. um, there are some circumstances where um, some people with disabilities are kind of born in such a way where mm -hmm. um, they will have it all their lives. And there are people who are blind, hard of hearing, um, and also um, because it's, it's genetic. It's something yeah. that makes up who we are as an individual. And it's very hard to identify all over the world people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So th th there's no real clear statistics um, on the number of individuals. Sure, David, you make a very good point. Malika, where would you like to leave us for this part of our conversation? Well, after this 30 minutes of conversation, this is what Alice Wong, who is a former guest on the stream, says, the problem is the lack of role models or visible people open about their disabilities in the workplace. She goes on to say, some employers can't imagine a disabled person in a position because they've never seen or experienced them. Uh, I, I think the examples that we've seen on our show and those who've been tweeting in uh, will go against that. Uh, as Alice puts it. 
All right, if you want to be part of this conversation, it is not too late. I am taking all of our guests online, so you have to go online as well to stream.aldezira.com to be continued employment and disabilities, the challenge and how to resolve those challenges. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Welcome back. We've been discussing how to give people with disabilities more access to jobs. There's lots of suggestions from our online community as, far as, as well as our panel here. I want to share uh, one suggestion. This is from someone named Matthew Shapiro, a former White House intern here in the U.S., and now he owns his own business, and he talks about the importance of self-employment. Have a listen to Matthew. When it comes to employment for people with disabilities, I feel that society very rarely discusses the option of self-employment for that population. I started my own disability consulting business because I couldn't find employment after I finished college. I think we as a society need to be talking about entrepreneurship and self-employment as an option for people with disabilities when it comes to employment so that they can become active members of their communities. So Senator, you look like you completely uh, agree with that uh, comment. I'll tell you another story. I know a young woman by the name of Emily Hillman very fast. Go for it. Emily went through school. She's a person with an intellectual disability. When she got out of school, she went into some make work job in a small town in Iowa. She told her mother she didn't like to do that. And her mother said, what do you want to do, Emily? She said, I want to run a coffee shop. Her mother said, where she ever came up with that? I don't know. But she said, they took her to school in Minneapolis, Minnesota to learn how to make lattes and uh, uh, espresso and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They came back to the small town of 6,000 people, went to the bank, borrowed some money, got a, a vacant storefront on Main Street, and Emily started her coffee shop, M's Coffee Shop in Independence, Iowa, five years ago. Today, she employs four people. It's the center for the town where people come, they have their coffee cups, they drink coffee, and it's, it's become the center of the community. Now, here's a person with a disability owning her own business employing people, but before she was thought, no, we have to just give her a make work job someplace. I'm telling you, there's more people like that all over the globe, I'll bet in Kenya or, or, or India or anywhere else, there's people that can have their own businesses, people with disabilities. I'll bet, I'll bet you know a lot of them too. Me, myself <laughs> included. <laughs> yourself yes. included. Yes, sure. yes, yeah. Lizzie, how did you get started in advocacy? Well, for me, it was a personal journey. Um, when I had an accident 15 years ago, I, I did not um, refer to myself as, as disabled. Fast forward, um, 2010, I had my daughter, and it was like a light bulb you know, went off, and I just needed to, be, to know who I was and um, be um, uh, the best that I can be for her. And that meant you know, being identifying as a disabled woman, as a disabled mother. And that took me on a journey of, I guess, self-discovery, and um, which led me to start my own business and um, uh, figure out how to help other disabled people um, find jobs, but also work with companies to help them figure out the process as well. Mm -hmm. um, Raja, I mean, you've been very positive on this program and you've been talking about all the ways that we can achieve inclusion with people with disabilities what is for you sometimes the moments where you find that it is difficult and it is challenging because sometimes you have to share those to make sure that people are ready for those challenges when are the difficult times sure um, you know, uh, you know, disability. For, first of all, you know, disability. There is also a diversity in disability. It's mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we talk about employment or anything, that you need to recognize there is a, a diversity in disability. The people, the needs of, uh, even in a particular in, in a one disability, the needs are different. You know, the person uh, low vision may have different needs than a person who is uh, who is fully uh, uh, blind. So uh, the challenge that we have, um, you know, we have been finding is um, you know breaking, uh, you know, breaking this. Balance 
barriers in in the corporate um, ecosystem of you know you know it's in in terms of locomotive mobility things are you know we, it's very clear you have universal design uh, accessible infrastructure um, you know they uh, break those attitudinal barriers and the, and the and the jobs happen but we still have a long way to go in, um, in the other disability uh, you know for example with uh, with deaf people you know we want that cycle to continue if somebody hires and then they come back and they want to hire again but uh, it's still taking a lot of our time to to meet those employers to meet various set of sets of employers convince them or oh, you know and you know the, the ecosystem around you know, for example, if you hire and hire a deaf person, you need sign language interpreter. So, wow. who pays for the uh, interpreter? How do you make the business case happen? You know, the business case is what will lead to more and more jobs. And proving the business case all and over again is definitely a challenge. And uh, I mean, want the ecosystem to grow and have more players like us come in and uh, make sure uh, that is broken. Just looking here at the Harkin International Disability Employment Summit. Good news me, Senator. You have a whole summit named after you. Let me just scroll down here. David, what are you doing in the summit? What are you, what, why are you there? Um, actually, the summit is very new to me. I don't know too much about the employment summit that Harkin is doing. Yeah, you're sitting next door to the Senator. He um, could probably <laughs> fill you in. He could tell absolutely. you the whole agenda. But, but I could tell you, I have a really good connection with Senator Harkin. Yes. Um, because of the work I've done in the disability community, I started my advocacy work with Special Olympics, mm. and that's where it started for me personally. Yeah, we're big fans of the Special Olympics and industry. And when you look at my website, you can see how much um, activity is going on in the disability community mm -hmm. here in the U.S., but also in other parts of the world too. Sure. Um, the only thing I could tell you about my connection with Harkin, as I was saying earlier, yeah. um, was a constituency from the state of Iowa, and. I think Harkin can explain more about this in his story. And when I testified on his hub committee, I, I, the, the, the first couple of words in my testimony speech that I gave was that I was the first recipient to receive the Dan Piper Award. Uh -huh. And Harkin was very um, big on this because he also hired Dan Piper to work for his state in Iowa. Um, so if you would like to share a little bit of that story. That's fine, that's fine, sure, sure, what the heck. Thanks, David, for hosting the rest of the show. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> I'll just go and get you myself a cup out. of He'll tea. Take over, all right? <laughs> you talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Senator. What? Tell, to, David just set you up nicely to oh. tell the rest of that story. Well, look, um, Dan Piper actually was the first person with uh, Down syndrome to ever testify before a committee, mine. Sorry, David, you were the second. <laughs> anyway, okay. uh, Dan Piper showed uh, his family, his community, that he shouldn't be restricted. He could go out and work. He could live by himself and, and structure his own life without everybody telling him who he was and what he could do and how limited he was. Uh, it just, he was really a trailblazer. That's why you getting the Dan Piper Award is very meaningful to me. As we were getting ready for the show, we had a, a we have a pre-show meeting, and I was talking to the team, and I said, "Is is this? Are we going to take this idea of employment and disabilities from a U.S. angle?" And we said, "No, no, no. We want to make sure it's an international angle as well, because it's a it's a universal issue, a universal challenge." Lizzie and Raja, when you get together with other advocates from around the world, what is it that you talk about? What's the common ground? Lizzie, you start. For me, I like to know what other countries are doing mm -hmm. and um, speak from the Kenyan experience and take what I can, what is um, practical, um, what we could readily use, what you know would take um, a bit of strategy. Can you give us an example of something that you've heard from another country that's actually quite helpful to you? I think what I've heard is um, the American experience with the ADA. Um, I think and correct me if I'm wrong, but the use of the legal system yeah. to enforce you know, the Disability Act. Mm -hmm. And I would like to take that home with me. I would like for more Kenyans with disabilities to use the legal system mm -hmm. to advocate for, for their rights. Mm -hmm. um, I would like um, a citizenship um, that was able to engage with government. So create those platforms, um, those spaces that 
we as persons with disabilities can actually um, articulate and demand um, our rights. So those are some of the mm -hmm. things that I think have, have pushed the um, um, ADA and um, have got it to where it is. You know, parents with disabilities getting involved, you know, people with disabilities being able to, to um, uh, challenge government and other stakeholders to, to enforce some of these issues. And Lizzie, don't forget, uh, uh, all these countries have now signed on to the, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which is sort of modeled after yes. the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes. So apart from the US, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank, yeah, you for, yeah. thank you for telling me. Yes, and really now good. it gets <laughs> tough. It's, it's an embarrassment. Yikes. <laughs> and the senator goes on. red. Let me just show you here. This yes. is Article 27, Work and Employment Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, signed up by pretty much everybody, apart from the United States. Yeah. <sighs> well, President Obama signed it, OK? <laughs> yes. So we did sign it. Yes. But the Senate didn't ratify it, right. that's another story. It's, as I said, it's an embarrassment work, for the United work States. Work to be done. But nonetheless, even yeah. though we never signed on up, we want to work, and that's mm -hmm. one of the purposes of this summit, is yes. to work with other countries. What can we do together? Uh, uh, look, the United States, we're not, a lot of times we always say we're the best, and we're not the best at this. Our unemployment rate among people with disabilities mm -hmm. is probably as bad as a Actually, you're, you're a some of the worst. Of the United yes. States is one of the worst. It's, it's not good yeah. in, in the United States. Yeah. So we can learn from other countries. Yeah. What are other people doing? I, I've been around the world looking at uh, different approaches uh, for, uh, on rights of people with disabilities, and there's a lot of great ideas out mm. there uh, in the world community. Uh, but what we wanted to focus on on, on the summit was employment. Just yeah. I want a laser-like focus. Mm. Uh, I, I would just close, I'd just say this, look, Yes, you have to have support mechanisms. You have to have transportation, housing, health, all these other things. I got that. Yeah. But if we wait until the infrastructure's in place, mm -hmm. we'll never have jobs for people with disabilities. My thing is get the jobs out there. And you know what will happen? Right. Governments, civil society will start to now come in and fill in some of the uh, support mechanisms. And the other thing I have found, and I'll bet you have too, Lizzie, David, I know knows this, Raja, that you get a person with a disability a good job for which they're qualified in competitive integrated employment, they will figure out how to get to and from work. Yeah. They'll figure out how to live. And then they'll start to set up their own systems, which then morph and become systems for other people. That's why I just think a job is so vitally important for people with disabilities. And it also helps yes. um, bring more economic growth um, in all p parts of society that Harkin just already um, pointed out on. Um, but, uh, but when you travel around the world, you don't get many success stories of individuals with disabilities or being exposed in the media like what we're doing here today. Um, so it really puts the focus on how to work with individuals with disabilities. S um, and there's many ways that we can do that. Mm -hmm. I just want to put out one other thing is that I'm working very hard with other organizations like the, like the National Down Syndrome Society. We're starting an employment guide for our employers, um, he, primarily mostly in the US. I hope it, I hope it, it could go internationally if it could, um, but we're not there yet. I know there's a lot of legislation to work on to make sure that what Harkin says is the systems are in place for this. But to talk about the employment guide, it's called Hashtag DS Works. It's a national campaign, and the NDSS is gonna be highlighting this next year in April at their National Buddy Walk on Washington. And I hope that all of you can really participate and actively be involved in this work. All right, guess I'm gonna wrap it up for now. Thank you so much for being part of this program, Senator and David and Lizzie and Raja. Malika, what do you want to leave us with? Well, well I, I pulled up on my screen here the hashtag DSWorks. There's lots of tweets under that. So, of course, that's what David just mentioned. You can peruse that hashtag. Also for perusing, because this conversation could go on all day. Uh, it can continue online. Handicap International US tweeted us this. Enjoyed this AJ stream on employing people with disabilities. We're continuing the conversation this week at the hashtag Harkin Summit. Stay tuned at Harkin Summit. And, of course, there's more conversation to be had under that hashtag as well. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. Take care.